Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our Gospel lesson for Quinquagesima Sunday from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. The healing of the blind beggar, especially these verses that precede this miracle of our Lord in which Jesus says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, I can't see any of you right now. I see some blobs sitting up toward the front, and I see kind of a sea of different colors toward the back, but you could be making faces at me right now and I would have no idea. And that's not an invitation. <laughs> you know, my eyesight has been getting worse and worse throughout my life. I first got glasses in third grade. I didn't realize how bad my eyes had gotten, but I had my eyes checked out. I was fitted for some glasses and I was amazed after getting these glasses on, I could see the writing on the board. I could see individual leaves on trees. It's like the whole world was opened back up to me. Ever since then, I've really depended upon my glasses. I tried contacts for a few years, but I don't think I'm ever going back to those. But my glasses have always been something for which I'm thankful but also something of a pain. You know, they'll wear on my nose, they'll wear on my ears, they get dirty, you have to clean them. And especially with a child, having glasses is very difficult. I've often wondered if Jesus could heal the blind man in our text, if he could take someone who didn't have any eyesight and heal him so that the whole world is opened up to him. Why has Jesus consigned me to be dependent on these glasses? Now that might seem ungrateful to you. After all, I can still see. I can see fine right now. I should count my blessings. But I still wonder sometimes why does God leave us to suffer from things when He is perfectly capable of delivering us from them? Why does He leave us subject to surgeries when He Himself could do the least invasive procedure and just grant immediate healing? Why does He leave us subject to death? Why does He leave us in the midst of such torments? Why does He leave us subject to sin? Subject to stress? Subject to heartbreak, sadness, depression? All the things that beset us during this earthly life. Well, that's something that the blind man in our text didn't have to worry about so much for a little while. God had subjected him to blindness for a time, but God delivered him from that blindness through the son of David, through him who, it was promised, would reign on the throne of his father David forever, who would grant recovery of sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and freedom to the captives and so on. This man had deliverance, deliverance that he could see, he had results here and now. But I always thought it would be really interesting to follow the stories of these folks in the scriptural accounts who experienced miraculous healings at the hands of Jesus. Like I wonder, what was Lazarus' life like after his resurrection? 
What things did he suffer from in the years following his rising from the grave? Likewise, I wonder about this man. What things afflicted him in the years after his recovery of sight? He could see now, but what about his appendix? What about his tonsils? What about his heart? What about his digestion? Did he have other problems following this miracle? Did he have other trials? Did he witness the suffering of loved ones? Did he suffer from stresses? Did he always have absolutely everything he needed, or was he ever in a state of want? I think, to be realistic, life probably wasn't exactly perfect for this beggar after he recovered his sight. I'm sure he still had a long road ahead of him. But you know who also had a long road ahead of him? It was Jesus the son of David, who granted this miraculous healing. After all, when Jesus stopped by to heal this man, to grant recovery of sight to this blind beggar, he was on his way to do something quite different. He was on his way to suffer. As he said to his disciples, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, to Pontius Pilate, to the Roman authorities. He will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon, they'll flog him and they'll kill him. Jesus was on his way to suffer. And he took a little detour on his way to suffer to grant recovery of sight to this blind beggar. But after that, he kept on his way. And he went through his sufferings. He traveled through the valley of the shadow of death. And then he came out on the other side. On the third day, Jesus says, he will rise. And so he did. Jesus rose to great glory. He rose and for 40 days showed himself in the perfection of holiness to his disciples. And then ascended visibly into heaven, there to be enthroned at the right hand of God the Father Almighty where he reigns even now in glory and splendor upon the eternal throne of his father David. But what a road he had to travel to get there. Our Lord suffered much before entering into his glories. And I think that taking this detour to grant recovery of sight to this blind beggar shows us something very important. That though we suffer with him, though we are currently on our way through the valley of the shadow of death, nevertheless, he has granted us a glimpse into what he has in store for us. He won't necessarily grant us every healing that our hearts desire during this earthly life, but he has shown us that he can deliver us, and he has shown us that he will deliver us. That means that in the midst of our sufferings, we are called to two things. We are called to patience, and we're called to hope. We are called to patience, that is to endure in our sufferings, not to give up, not to complain under the burdens that God places upon us, but to follow the example of our Savior, who as a lamb before his shears is silent, so opened not his mouth, but suffered willingly all that God had ordained for him. We are called to have patience like he had, but we are also called to hope, because we know that at the end of it all, we will receive whatever healing we need, whatever gifts we need, whatever deliverance we need, God has it all in store for us in the life to come. Now, it's easy to get impatient in our sufferings. It's easy to complain about the things that ail us. As much as I appreciate my glasses, I sure have an easy time complaining about them. It's easy for me to, to complain about the little aches and pains that I have at my 
ripe old age of 33, it's easy for me to complain about the stresses that I experience. It's easy to complain about this and that. It's easy to grow impatient as I see the sufferings of others. But we're not called to impatience. We're not called to grumbling and complaining as the Israelites did in the wilderness. We are called to patience in suffering. Jesus, after all, was patient. And Jesus suffered far more than we do. It's not to minimize our sufferings. Our sufferings are real. And I know that many of you have suffered terribly in this life from various things. You've witnessed the sufferings of others. You've undergone much trial, much tribulation. That's real suffering. It is not to be dismissed. But consider the sufferings of your Savior. Do our sufferings compare to being publicly beaten and tortured? Do our sufferings compare to having nails driven through our hands and feet to affix us to a piece of wood where we are to hang and bleed until we die in anguish? Do our sufferings compare to crying out in desperation, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, knowing that we are suffering the full brunt of God's wrath against the sin of the world. Our sufferings can be terrible, but our Savior has suffered more than the rest of the world put together. Our Savior has suffered and He has endured. In the midst of His sufferings, He did not complain. He did not question God's mercy or goodness but he received willingly from the Father's hand whatever God had ordained for him to suffer. And we are called to join him. We are called to endure with him. Now Jesus suffered as one who knew the joy set before him. He suffered as one who knew that there would be an end to his sufferings. He suffered as one who knew that... Having gone through this torment, he would enter into glory and splendor, joy and happiness. And that knowledge, I'm sure, helped to sustain him in his humanity as he went through the terrible things that God had ordained for him. So also, we are granted a glimpse of what God has promised us a glimpse that helps us to endure in our sufferings. Jesus granted us such a glimpse in the healing of this blind beggar. He showed that he truly is concerned for us in our sufferings. And he truly does have healing in store for us. And where we draw our patience as we undergo the sufferings that God has ordained for us, is from the hope that He sets before us. The hope with which His Spirit fills us as we look forward with confidence and joy to all that God has planned for us in the life to come. I suffer from a few things. Not as badly as most others, I think. But I do look forward to waking up on the last day waking up in my casket. I suspect that I'll be buried with my glasses on. But when I wake up in that casket and sit up and rise through the earth, the glasses won't be joining me. They'll stay there in the earth. So will all of my silly little pains and everything, all of my sins all of my weaknesses, all the things that bother me about this life, they're all going to stay there in the grave, but I'm going to rise through the earth and I'm going to stand in my flesh before God and with my own eyes see that my Redeemer lives. 
And you too. Whatever things torment you, whatever things trouble you or burden you or weigh you down, on the last day you will awake and leave them behind. You too will rise up and you will see God's new creation. You will behold the new heavens and the new earth, the inheritance which your heavenly Father has prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. And you will stand before God and you will rejoice, knowing that what Jesus, the Son of David, did for this blind beggar was but the tiniest foretaste of what He's going to do for all of us. That now that sin and death have been entirely conquered and placed under the feet of the King, now we are to stand before Him in righteousness and peace and joy and health and happiness as we look forward to an eternity of life with our God and our Christ. That really does give me a certain degree of happiness in the midst of sufferings. To think that the people whose sufferings I witness aren't destined to suffer like that forever, but God will relieve their sufferings in the world to come. The things that weigh upon me will not be weighing upon me forever, but they'll remain in the grave, and I will enter into the blessedness of God's kingdom. What glories Christ has shown us by His manifold miracles during His earthly ministry. What glories He has given us a glimpse into by healing this blind beggar and by all the rest, by raising Lazarus from the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out demons. All those things that He did were just uh, the, the smallest preview of what He has in store for all of us on the last day. Yes, we come to it through suffering, even as Jesus did. But as St. Peter encourages us, let us suffer with Him and rejoice in those sufferings, knowing that we will share with Him in His glory. God grant to us all patience and hope in the midst of whatever sufferings it has pleased Him to allow us to endure that we may come through them filled with love for our Savior, who by His suffering purchased our forgiveness, life, and salvation, that we may enter into His blessedness, which will have no end. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.